Hello and welcome to Next 2.0 on WQLM PBS NPR. Next is produced by the Public's Voice Media. I'm your host, Marcus Atkinson. I'm here with my guest host, Mark Blunt. And if you want to know more about Next 2.0, you can go to Facebook and like the page. You can follow us on Instagram at Next 2.0 Erie. There you can keep up with upcoming show promos, events, and clips about what's next for our communities and our democracy. Thank you so much for tuning in. You probably notice that there's noise in the background. You probably hear television, you hear the hum of clippers, you hear people going around a little bit. That's because we're on location here at a local barbershop, the Heads of State Barbershop. State Street, Erie, Pennsylvania, by the way. That's right. And I know, Mark, this is a barbershop that you frequent regularly, and we wanted to come here just so you, the listener, can get a feel for this organic conversation that spurs up in these shops. I want to say it was in this shop. That you and I used to used to uh, chop it up, chop the, it up the, the most, man. Yes. What is it about barbershops, man, to bring out the best in conversation with people, you think? I believe it's become the hub for men, black men, to or men in general, to talk about things that they want to talk about. And it's always been, for me, that place. This is one few, this was the first place that I got my impression as a young man yeah. about how our men think. My father and his crew, they would have their conversations and I would sit back and I would just listen to them, mm-hmm. be it sports or life. If you're from Erie, you may have heard of Atkinson's Barbershop and obviously I'm an Atkinson. And my Uncle Bill, my Uncle Clinton, we call him, uh, Bill Atkinson started that barbershop years ago, proud little shop on the corner of 21st and Reed. And I remember going there as a kid and you would get all the scuttlebutt about what was going on in the neighborhood. You'd get that man talk Everything from marriage to kids to the system, you know, to the other man, to the brother man, all and everything in between, you know, sports, all of these different discussions you got in the barbershop. And like Mark said, it was just kind of a rite of passage, you know, because in our communities and we got two of our, our brothers joining us here. We got Mr. Al Smitherman, one of the, the lead barbers here by Al. Welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. All right, and we got our good friend, the good doctor, Dr. Paris Baker, joining. He's in here getting a haircut, and of course we had to have him sit down. Dr. Baker, welcome to the show. Thank you, sir. And so to level set this before I, I throw it out to the group, in our communities we have a such thing as staying out of grown folks' business. And so I can't speak for your households before a lot of the households that we grew up in, when grown folk were talking, we couldn't come in and interject our little 10-year-old opinion. <laughs> that was anathema. You'd get corrected, sent to the room. You might even get your butt whooped, depending on the circumstances. Yes. But like Mark said, going to the shop, you got a chance to, as a child to really get a glimpse into how black men think. You are allowed to be a fly on the wall legally without being told to get out of the room because grown folk are talking. So it was always fascinating for me to listen to my dad's take, my uncle's take, my grandfather's take. And I'm like, okay, that's real interesting. You know, and so this is an institution. And so, Brother Smitherman, talk to us about this culture. What, what got you interested in being a part of this culture now that you're at the epicenter of it? Well, I think it's exactly what you said, you know, just I used to be I used to go to the barbershop with my stepdad and to be in that environment where you were just sitting around and watching these older gentlemen interact with one another it was at the time for me fascinating they talked about everything from sports to relationships to politics to 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 religion everything it was everything was discussed and it was just fascinating to be in that environment I learned so much so it made me want to be a part of it and to reciprocate some of those same lessons that I've learned amongst the people in my community and particularly the children that come in and out of here. So, Dr. Baker, talk about the experience from your perspective. Uh, full disclosure here, um, I used to sit in Eddie Smart and Bill and then Bill moved. Yep. And uh, when I began writing, I used to take notes before the, the movie Barbershop. I was trying to do a play. <clears throat> so the best place to get information, write a script, is just go in a barbershop and sit and listen to them. these amazing stories. Fortunately, I didn't have enough money to pull it off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the idea, and, and you know, barbershop one, two, and three, and all that. Um, <laughs> so uh, for me, uh, the barbershop is somewhat like church, which is interesting. Um, because right now, folks may not be returning to church, but we're going to get a haircut. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. And so there's a lot of socialization that happens and a lot of information back and forth, whether it's formal or informal, is happening in the barbershop. Yeah. 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 And I might add, for a young black male, it's probably the barber is one of the first outside members of the families 
that you meet first. And then there's that test of getting in the barber chair and you're getting your first haircut. And you have to have that trust. Either the mom's there or the dad's there. Mm -hmm. Sit still. Get over that. Mr. Atkinson, I watched him do it masterfully all, all this time. And Al and some of the barbers here. But with the little sucker, they give him a little sucker. But that's the first person you learn to trust mm -hmm. outside of your family is the barber. Yeah. Absolutely. Deep, deep, if I may, if I may, if I Absolutely. may add. Deep, deep relationships have been made in the barber shop where me personally I've watched generations of people sit in my chair from the father to their sons who are now fathers I mean you, you see so much <coughs> just dealing with a particular family for so long you, you become a family member you know by default right you understand you, the dynamics yes yes absolutely so yeah it, it, it's something let me ask you this before we go into the topics Al COVID-19 Right. When you look at the cultural, the cultural implications of the barbershop, the cultural uh, relevance of the barbershop, what it means to the African-American community in particular and some other communities for that matter. How did that affect the culture from this vantage point when COVID-19 hit? Because the socialization aspect of it was. Yeah, that interrupted. Part, yeah, that that part was was very. Uh, was very harmful for the barber because it 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 it. it prevented us from that aspect of our business the socialization part you know what I mean not 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 so much the fact of not being able to provide um, but the socialization aspect was cut off and and I think that's a major part of what we do in this business as barbers is, is what's looked for you know what I mean you you may not even need a haircut but you're gonna come to the barber shop just just because the environment the socialization aspect of it and yeah COVID-19 played a, a major role in cutting that off for for the time that it was around it, it it still plays a part it plays its part but it was it was very very harmful uh 2021. Mm -hmm. we got one of our young thinkers that just came into the barbershop Mr. Charles Brown don't make the mistake of calling him C Brown he'll correct you <laughs> I'm like, okay, Jay, he growing up. He told me, that's, that's Charles. I'm like, oh, my bad. <laughs> oh, Mr. Brown, welcome in, man. Welcome in. Up, man? Yeah, yeah. So, but that was, you know, made me think about it because even for, well, for our culture in particular, again, especially for men, like this is it. And we had a lot of discussions. I know you, you've dealt with, Dr. Beck, you've dealt with fatherhood and manhood a lot and just being able to express ourselves and having a safe space to express ourselves without feeling judged and everything. This has been one of those spaces. This is that space. You know, so I would imagine there were a lot of men who were feeling it when they couldn't go. Absolutely. And not just get their cut, but have their say and hear everybody else. Absolutely. You know. Yeah. All, right, All right, brother. All right. All right. All right. All right. And so when, when, you, when you're at the shop, Lily, what are you hearing from a lot of the, uh, the customers? What are folks talking about these days? These days, they're talking about everything. It's politics. It's, 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 it's the, the, uh, the ongoing wars around the world. It's uh, celebrity life in Hollywood. It's, it's personal life. It's the, the community life. Every, you, yeah. Everything under the sun is a topic of conversation in the barbershop. Sports, obviously sports. Mm -hmm. and you name it. Well, how about this one? Try this on for size. The death of O.J. Simpson. Mm. Mm. The death of O.J. Simpson. What does that mean from a cultural standpoint, from a, from a pop culture standpoint? The death of O.J. Simpson. Well, for me, it's a, it's a point of um, confusion and conflict because I grew up in the era where O.J. Simpson was a hero. Mm -hmm. You know, um, first 2,000-yard runner and the whole bit and the, the commercials and so... He was really high on the pedestal, and then you know, subsequent to that, with all the stuff after he retired, and uh, whether you believe he's guilty or innocent, that whole situation uh, brought some attention to the issues of race. Because if you remember very clearly, I, I remember that close my eyes distinctly um, when those officers were acquitted. There was a fracture in the United States, mm -hmm. and it was across campuses and across the United States. You talking about the Rodney King trial, uh, and 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 the O.J. Simpson. When, okay. Yeah, when the officers. Got you. Yeah, yeah. Um, and yeah, Furman was the with Doctor. I mean, um, 
Well, I can't correct it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. But there was a fracture, and maybe I got the names wrong, but clearly the when when uh, he was found not guilty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, there was how could he how could he not be guilty? Mm-hmm. And that was primarily from a white audience. You know, like he had to do it. Where on the black community, again from, from my perspective, it was not real sure and you don't want to see him guilty in the whole bit, you know. Yeah. So, yeah, so it was a lot of tension. I remember that clearly. It was a lot of tension around OJ. And then, you know, what's going on right now uh, mm-hmm. at his death. Mm-hmm. And, and I mean, and just, you know, to be so high and to fall so low, um, it's just hard to talk about, like hard to mm-hmm. like put your head around it and make sense of well, who this man was. Like where in history, contextual do you put it? That's the, yeah. that's the question. Yeah. Yeah. And Mark, before you say what you what you have to say, in theory, this is a man who had, in his, in his heyday, transcended race, and yes. I'm throwing up air quotes, mm-hmm. right? Yeah. Indeed. Because why, this is, he's running through the airport and the old white, like, oh, OJ, yeah. go! Yeah. Yeah. They loved Orenthal James, <laughs> and, you know, Simpson. Yeah. Yeah. And so to see how everything turned out is really a trip. Go ahead, what you were saying, Mark. No, what I, what I was going to say was OJ, as you said, was probably one of the first accepted, commercially yeah. accepted athlete. Whereas he kind of broke from the, I want to go to Ali and the Jim Browns and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's. They were considered probably more connected with our community than maybe OJ was. OJ was not the type of activist athlete. He was, quote unquote, like a corporate. He said, I'm not black, I'm OJ. There yeah. you go. Mm-hmm. So when, when you do that, there's a dynamic about OJ of, yes, we was proud of his athleticism. Yes, OJ was a hell of a running back. Mm-hmm. But as far as hitting the pop culture, as far as emotionally and consciously, I don't know if he was like Jim Brown. And I, I always kind of felt, to be truthful with you, Jim Brown, I believe, died the year before. I don't think he got his proper send-off nor recognition as far as what Jim Brown was to us Mm -hmm. and who he was to us because this is the first guy compared to Superman. I mean, like, if there was a Superman, like how Larry Bird said, if God Mm -hmm. was in uniform, it must be in 23 in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Well, the first thing they said, no, Superman ain't in the comic book. He's in Cleveland wearing number 32. Mm -hmm. And this is what it was. Jim Brown was that type of guy. And the first one to move to the movies that starts this this thing, but he was always connected to us. And it seemed like he always centered himself around quote unquote blackness. Is he the reason that OJ wore the number that he wore? Did I hear that correctly? He is 32. Okay. He is 32. Although OJ, look, OJ was, OJ was one of the best backs I ever saw in my life. But so was Sweetness. Mm -hmm. And even Sweetness, when he passed, it was, yes, they were great running backs. Very good. I got Sweetness as my number one in my lifetime. Yeah, he's up there. However, the connection these athletes, some of these don't have the quote unquote connection that right. some yeah. have, like Ali. Yeah. I felt like I lost not only a hero, a family member, a mentor, or whatever. Ali represented us and he carried that weight. Mm-hmm. I didn't get that from OJ. So, this Brother Smith, let me speak to this then. So, the, the famous quote I'm not black, I'm OJ. And yet, <laughs> when it all goes down, black folk lined up behind OJ. Indeed. Right? He's Indeed. one of ours. Mm-hmm. Back up off of him, right? Talk about that, because there's a whole lot of black folk that are like, listen, man, we too quick to take these folks back, man. When they quote unquote abandon us, they're bigger than us. Now they're in trouble and they back, and we better talk about. Because I know that's come up in the shop, and I know you got your own two cents <laughs> yeah, on the yeah. topic, and it don't have to be politically correct. It's your thoughts. <laughs> my, my thoughts is we backed we as a people backed OJ because of the, uh, if you will, the long, long history of injustice done amongst us or to us. And we were on OJ's side just for that reason because he looked like us and we want Mm -hmm. him to be not guilty of whatever it is Mm -hmm. they say he did, whether he did it or not. You know what I mean? I think on on that level was where where we stood as a people. And for for that matter, even as, as far as accepting him back into the fold of quote unquote blackness, it was for all those reasons is that we wanted to, uh, if you will, get our lick back at 
at the other side. As bad as that and sounds, th- I think there's some validity to that. Yes, yes, and I think that that's that's part of the reason why we accepted OJ for who he was and what he said and what he did. Yeah. I think, Dr. Baker, I think you did a good job laying the foundation for that because I think that is where it goes back to, right? I'll never forget that. When they showed the Rodney King, you know, lynching, if you will, for, for the Absolutely. most part. When they showed this, and we sit, we all sitting here watching it on video, and I remember said, there is no way they're getting off with this. Mm-hmm. It's on video. Right. And when they got acquitted, the black folks were like, what in the hell just happened? Right. And it. So like you said, there was there was a there was a fracture there, mm-hmm. you know. Talk about it. Well, I want to connect that to one of the confusing moments, though, because there's a fracture in the in the black and white community. That OJ got a white wife. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So like, how do you reconcile that? Yeah. And and again, you know, in the, in the time that he's coming up, you know, America had some very serious laws for interracial dating and marrying and a whole bit. Mm-hmm. So. Um, who was he representing? What was he representing? Mm-hmm. And I think, you know, part of the, the issue, I'll get back to the, the question, is does he represent us or me? When he, when that quote, mm-hmm. very clearly, he's he's me focused. Right. right. And so, you know, in this in this barbershop, we can talk about sweetness and, and I gotta throw in Barry Sanders. There we okay. Go. Yeah. There we go. You gotta know yeah. your history when you come to a barbershop. Yeah. 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 Nah, There's gonna be some that. debates. Okay. Mm. Um, but who does he represent? And so the conversation here in a barbershop or in some form, does he really represent me? Mm. You know, and, and like the pathway, can I get to the same place he is following the steps that he laid out? Mm-hmm. I'm not real sure. And so when you look at Ali, uh, when you look at um, uh, Jim Brown, it's, it's, it's kind of a very clear uh, uh, legacy that says from blackness to blackness, you can get to me through this pathway. Where with OJ, it, there's kind of some spinoffs and some commercialization that, that that may not be me, and I don't have all those gifts and talents and those yeah. kind of things. So. I hate to take it here, but did Jordan pick up on the I'm not black, I'm OJ? Did he take that hmm. baton and run with it a little bit during his career? I think Jordan did it in a shrewder way. I, I'm not gonna say he did what OJ did, simply because of this. His his thing was Republicans buy shoes too, <laughs> especially the new gold MAGA shoes. <laughs> yes, this oh dude actually God. got a collector's shoe out now. So yes. so when he did that, what I think he was saying not that he had turned his back on his people. The the blueprint now was don't let my politics get involved with my money. Mm-hmm. Right? Exactly. And that was to me the legacy of OJ. Mm-hmm. That that tree, whereas. LeBron, in my opinion, goes to the Jim Brown I agree with that. and the Muhammad Ali tree. I agree. And you say, <coughs> hey, and, 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 and I would say magic in some cases. Absolutely. But, but magic seems to have walked the path of both. He can do both mm-hmm. without anyone judging magic. As long as he keep cooking, I guess he could. we could say he, he's rooted in us. <laughs> And he's his business. He's he, he, yeah. right. Yeah. Cookie, the best yeah. thing that happened to that yeah. boy. Yeah. Or, 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 yeah. As long as he does that. Yeah. But with Jordan, the fact that he didn't support that uh, the candidate in North Carolina mm-hmm. over one of the most segregationist yeah. politicians in our lifetime was a statement. Mm-hmm. And those that were quote unquote, and I'm gonna use this phrase, woke and conscious uh-huh. at that time, we took offense to that. You know, whereas now you see where LeBron didn't take a back seat when it came to supporting the Obamas or what mm-hmm. have you. He clearly stated where he was at. In fact, that's where the lady says, shut up and dribble. Oh, mm-hmm. yeah, 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 mm-hmm. yeah. So you, he, he's, made, he's made a path where we can say stuff about Trayvon. He brought it back. Whereas Jordan, I wonder, Jordan got political when it came to 9-11, mm-hmm. but silence was there when it came for King. Mm-hmm. Silence was there for the original I Can't Breathe, Gardner. Mm-hmm. That was the blueprint of OJ, of the legacy of OJ, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, I, if, I, if I could add No, no, on. no. Interject as much as you want, brother. I'm not, I'm, I, what I'm wondering is if we, as a people or as a society, like to latch on to what we perceive as success, regardless of, like, like take Tiger Woods. 
Tiger mm. Woods openly says he he's not black, but we support. I mean, not just not just we, but everybody does. Mm. But black people in particular just love this dude mm-hmm. as not just as a golfer, but just mm-hmm. as a professional. Is it like I said? Is it is it is it the fact that we like to latch on to success? Success that we can see ourselves in that success. Going back to the OJ scene, like can we see a type of justice in the injustice by latching on to the not guilty verdict? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? I yeah. wonder if that's the mindset that we as a people have. These are topics that that come up often in the barber shop, you know, amongst amongst clients and 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 barbers, but not just on that level, just in sports and, and life particularly. Yeah. So Yeah, you got me thinking about a couple of things with that though, because here we got obviously we started with OJ, a transcendent athlete at his time. Mm-hmm. We go to Michael Jordan, a transcendent athlete. Mm-hmm. We go to Tiger Woods, a transcendent athlete. Mm-hmm. And each one of those times, whether it was Jordan and his gambling, right? Mm-hmm. Or Tiger Woods and his womanizing, and then obviously OJ with the homicide. Each one of those, take Jordan out of it because he knew he was black going in. Jordan's blue black, you know, from yeah, the yeah, Carolinas. Yeah. We all knew Jordan was black. But Tiger Woods found out the hard way what color he was. Absolutely. Once he ran into legal issues. Now all of a sudden, well, I, I get it. Well, hold up. Since <laughs> since we're in the barbershop, we're, we're going to do a little, we're gonna do a little fact yes. check in here. All right. Tiger was marketed as black when he first started out. Mm-hmm. He embraced it. Mm-hmm. In fact, it was Tiger that said he loved the. He kept a list of the courses he couldn't golf at because he was black when All he right. came back. Mm-hmm. When he got successful, mm-hmm. that's where this calibration stuff right. comes out. All right. All right. All right. Because just look at it. Oh, he invited Lee Elder. He invited them to the Masters. It was marketed that way. Mm-hmm. He he rolled with Obama. He rolled with the wave of diversity. Mm-hmm. But. At the moment of his, what he perceived as apex, what he perceived it, that's where, again, I'm on Oprah. Mm-hmm. And I use this, well, I'm calibration. Uh, so he tearing pages out of OJ's book. Oh, <laughs> no doubt. Okay. Because Fuzzy told him what he yeah. thought he was when he said, I hope they like chicken mm-hmm. after he won the thing. That being right. Fuzzy Zeller, ladies and gentlemen. He didn't right. say rice. Right. Right. He didn't say <laughs> yoga. <laughs> He said chicken. <laughs> he said chicken. He was yeah. quite clear. He Very was. Clear. This country's always been quite clear when right. I came back. You got that right. <laughs> Whatever. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say that um, when we come to the barbershop, um, what we're looking for are heroes. Who is the hero? And that's the discussion. And so, you know, your hero might be, your hero might be, and then we have to justify why did you choose that hero? Mm-hmm. And some of those heroes are controversial, you know, and again, get, get us back to for me, in the, in the conversations, the issue, and it gets to Tiger Woods or O.J. Simpson, because I'm a little bit older than y'all, is, particularly from the black female, is why is it that black men ascend the ladder, make it big, and then choose a white woman? Yeah. And mm-hmm. that was a source of tension. It caused a lot of controversy. Like, you were raised by a black woman, or a black man for Tiger in that case, in the black community, and blah, 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 blah. And then you get there, and you abandon you can do what you want, but you abandon the cause and the community and the whole bit. And, and so for me, it's, oh, that's always been the, the point of contention yeah. with, with OJ and Tigers and the whole bit. Well, that's, that's a point of contention today. I mean, full, full disclosure, that's my personal yeah. circumstance. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it's, it's, a, it's a point of conversation to this very second. Mm-hmm. And there's some controversial points to be made. I mean, that's a whole, yeah. I would love to get folk on to have that discussion Absolutely. because at the end of the day, there's a lot of nuances there, but there is a point to that. You know, and so for OJ, it was like exclusively his life and his choosing once he hit that level, mm-hmm. you know. Mm-hmm. Well, side note, our first athletic quote unquote superhero would have probably been Jack Johnson. Right. And Jack Johnson, that was the issue. That was the that issue. Was the issue. <laughs> that was the issue, was that pursuit. Now, Jack Johnson said he saw it as his freedom, mm-hmm. his his ability. Yeah. It, he doesn't see it as a conscious choice of that. He's ex- exercising his manhood. That's mm-hmm. how he saw it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Society said, no, you're saying something different. Mm-hmm. And Jack Johnson was his own man. Right? Yeah. You can't call him safe. He wasn't safe. I don't put him like a OJ. I put him as a shrewd man, mm-hmm. period. Right. And 
Think about it. There wasn't a black champion or a black allowed to even fight for champion after him for a yeah. long time. Yeah. Because that was the heavyweight champion of the world. You know what that meant yeah. at the time to hold that belt. Yeah. And I'll tell you what, what, what would make for a good show is on this one is, you know, I've asked a series, a series of socially conscious brothers who are married outside of their race, knowing everything you know now, would you do it again? And I think a lot of the answers would make for an intriguing mm. show. Mm. Yeah. Especially in the age of Trump, it would make for an intriguing show because it's a, it's a lot of gray when you start unpacking that thing. Yeah. <laughs> as, as a friend, I would just tell him, just remember, a happy wife is a happy life. It is. <laughs> so watch what you say on that show. Happy spouse is a happy house. There you go. There you go. I'm a big fan of Married at First Sight. Pastor Cal on Married at First Sight. That's his yeah, saying. Right. Happy spouse, yeah, happy yeah. house. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You know, but now following the political scene, Marjorie Taylor Green. Who was that sister? She. Who was that sister she in a, she insulted about uh, her eyelashes? Yeah, um, Dallas uh, Congresswoman uh, Crockett, I forget her first name. Oh, man. Uh, I'm sorry, because uh, we can remember Marjorie Taylor Greene. I can't remember the sister's name. Yeah. But Crockett's her last name. Yeah. And, and the B, 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 B. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I don't know if she had that prepared. I just, that just flowed out so, so yeah. easily. Knowing so, our sisters, yeah. it probably just flowed off the top yeah. of her dome. Yes. Because when she said it, um, the, 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 the person in charge of the proceedings said, huh, what does that mean? And he, she looked at him like, you don't get that? You know, because I watched that over and over again. Um, it, that was a, an amazing moment in congressional history, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah did y'all did y'all see that we talking about? Yes. Oh, man. Yeah. Break it down, Mark. Break it down. Well, again, they say that Green did a Karen. Get a Karen. And she she fired the first shot by saying maybe you don't understand because you your fake ass your fake uh, eyelashes, lashes, yeah. eyelashes is getting in the way, and that was allowed, mm -hmm. and they asked it to be stricken. Yeah. AOC comes AOC in, came in. And, and to her defense, mm -hmm. and she then said, well you're not intelligent enough mm -hmm. to to go with me or debate with me, so then they asked for that to be stricken. So when they didn't strike it, brilliantly, I might add, right. mm -hmm. I almost call it a Howard Stern type moment where she said, wait a minute, you mean to say if I was to call her mm -hmm. uh, uh, fake bleach blonde, <laughs> butch built <laughs> body, yeah. I can say that? Yeah. Or what have you? And then and that, was brilliant. <laughs> that was brilliant how she, how she did it in a proper way. She did it. So that was genius in how she responded back within the rules, within the rules. using the rules. Yeah. So she she responded that way. She didn't step out of line or anything like that. And I guess, you know, some people said, well, she didn't go to Michelle Obama way. When they go low, we go high. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking you're dealing with a different thing now, man. This is after Montgomery. And if you hit us or if you say something to us, mm -hmm. it's going to be something that's going to swim. And they're going to grab whatever, and they're coming back, and they're going to say whatever. Because Al, you set the tone for this. I got to bring you back into this, Al, because when I saw that, I thought this is yet another example of how political decorum, uh, the germane way of legislating, mm -hmm. has not just been thrown out the window. People have been embracing bully tactics, mm -hmm. uh, tactics tactics that scream ism of, of all sorts, and, and goes dog whistle is a waste of time now for a lot of folks. Right? Yes. From January 6th to now, the pattern, have you noticed this pattern? Mm -hmm. You know, what was that conversation like in the barbershop after January 6th? Because I know as black folk in general, we sitting there watching like, now what would this be like if yes. these was all black folks storming Absolutely. the Capitol? Mm -hmm. They would bomb the Capitol. It would have been a civil war. Just have been a civil talk, war. talk about that conversation in the shop when all of that went down. Yeah, yeah. After watching that on TV, man, it was it was it was a lot of discussion on how certain certain people or certain certain cultures can do certain things and get away with it versus us per se. You know what I mean? Like you said, if it had been if it had been a, a bunch of black people storming the Capitol like that, there would have been funerals all across the nation yeah. for everybody who who attempted that. But 
you know, I guess I don't know if it's the time that we're living in or if it's changing or whatnot, but it seems that that's what we face on a daily. You know, the the, the scale's not being balanced one way or another, and we're always on the unbalanced side of the scale. Things that we can do or that we attempt to do is, is shunned or, or, or looked at in a, in a, in a dark light. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because Dr. Baker, you came on the show before talking about the two Justins. Boy, how sensitive <coughs> the legislation was when it came to the two Justins. Mm-hmm. But it took AOC to come and say, hey, 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 we okay with this? Right. Mm. When it came to her statements. Yeah, and, and one of the things, it, it was interesting um, in, the, in, the, in the debate where AOC came in and she, she said, following the rules to the Republican Party who said, we are the rural people. So this is the rule, you have to have restrictions. But she insisted, and that must be followed with an apology. And that's where the tension happened. She said, I'll, I'll, you can take it off, uh, stricken it from the record, but I'm not apologizing. And then she got the attack back, well, you must not be intelligent enough. And then she went into her pre- Puerto Rican Latina thing and said, baby girl, I, will exactly. yeah, and I remember that clearly. Like, you just don't know, this is about to get real. And I thought at that moment, I said, don't stand up, because it'll get real then for sure. Because there mm. are different ways of handling these kind of disputes, and you ain't ready for it this right. way, but I grew up in the Bronx or where, somewhere in New York, and this is how we handle this kind of conflict. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, and then uh, her name is Jasmine, I had to look at Jasmine Crockett. Yeah, gotcha. And, and her comment was, and again, going back to the Justins in, in Tennessee, is while there are rules to be followed, make no mistake about the historical context that there are certain groups in power that use the rules to their advantage. And so if breaking the rule serves my advantage, then I'll break the rules, but you can't do that. And mm-hmm. so I'm gonna hold you to the letter of the law, but we'll violate them all day, all day long. Yeah. And the larger picture for me is this. You know, while we talk about trunk- Trumpism and, and the MAGA stuff, you know, it gets back to, get, it will get back to, America is a racist country, period. And, and it just keeps showing up. Trump is a symptom that takes us back to what is the ideology, ideology of America, and it is built from the million races, and that's why it keeps showing up. You know, the, the, the storming of the Capitol mm-hmm. is not the first time a Capitol. People forget there was a, a threat in Michigan of storming mm-hmm. the Capitol and kidnapping a governor. There sure was. Absolutely. There was threats all over America about if we don't get our way, this is what we're going to do. You know, blocking access to, to capital buildings and mm-hmm. all. It's almost like children like if we don't get our way you know we're going to stop right so right and and in in, in in america was kind of like boiling and percolating that's why we started talking about things like well are we heading for a civil war mm-hmm. well, we've always been there you yeah know? again you know this civil war after civil war with reconstruction when black folks was doing well <laughs> folks lost their mind yeah yeah and that's when you saw the Ku Klux Klan and all the other uh, paramilitary, uh, racist, supremacist group, white supremacist groups that mm-hmm. popped up because we gonna have it our way, yeah. no matter what we have to do about that. So, yeah, they just they just sentenced the guy that broke into Nancy Pelosi's career, right? For yeah. it assaulted her husband again yeah. with 30, 30 years, something like that. Yeah. You know. It's, it's, yeah. Now you're right. You're starting to see these bubble up all over the place. How, how about the video of? Oh man, they were talking about it today on CNN. The video with Trump, the Trumps. That Trump's um, campaign site shared mm-hmm. yeah. about the the Reich and the bringing yes. the Reich mm-hmm. Ex- exactly, yes. and so the the language of Hitler and and that whole era being not just utilized but um, condoned, if you will. If you think about President Obama saying, "The first day I'm in office, I'm gonna be a dictator." What what America would have, what would have happened in America if he had even uttered that thought? Yeah. Like, just, just parenthetically, you know, just yeah. hypothetically, I, w- I want to be a dictator for one day. Yeah. The man wore a tan suit one day, and America it lost, lost his mind. their mind. <laughs> if if he if he had made that announcement, it this just in: Barack Obama's <laughs> poll numbers plummet as, as he announces his goals to be a dictator. Would Jesus. You? <laughs> so. Then I think. A comment that may, depend on who hears this, stick out. And it, it, here's the question. Paris has said that this country is like, and it, it's a racist country. Therein lies the debate. Because there's people that believe 
that it's not. That, you know, as we had a conversation on one of our last shows, I was with you, where he was, one of our co-hosts said, that we fight for freedoms and we fight for justice and we fight for whatever. And then we have a poet that writes, America has never been America to me. Right. And there's these two dynamics living in the same country that got two different experiences here. Mm-hmm. And their reality is, well, sure, we fight for freedom. We got a superhero that say he fights for liberty, justice, or whatever. Mm-hmm. But he never showed up in the South. Right. He never flew there. There was never that episode. <laughs> <laughs> he never marched on the bridge with them to say, yeah. fight for the American way of liberty and justice. Yeah. Or never showed up for that. However, that is part of our problem. Yeah. where we really have to get down and have that really conversation. I know what it says on paper, mm-hmm. but our practice, potentially, this could be a great country. It, oh, could, yeah. it could be by far better. Mm-hmm. It says a more perfect union anyway. Mm-hmm. And How, however, indeed. where we're at and what we've done and what we are doing, we need to really take a look. But to say that there's not or a history of racism embedded in this country, is to be in denial. Right? Mm, that storm in the Capitol thing, Al, you wanted to put some historical context on that storm in the Capitol thing. I, I, I do. Going, first of all, as I stated just a little while ago, what, what, what's allowed for the other man is, is not tolerated from us. And there, there was a time 50, 50, maybe 54 years ago where the Black Panthers Organized an organized group stormed the Capitol in California mm-hmm. for their cause, rifled carrying mm-hmm. Black Panther, Black men. That was the organization that, you know, they they put forth this effort to to be heard. Mm-hmm. I think we're fighting we're fighting the same injustices on a political level, and I'm not shunning that. We're 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 gaining ground in that area, but grassroots efforts have always been in my opinion, the best efforts and getting too, not so much too involved, but deeply involved in politics, we seem to forget those grassroots efforts. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, 1921. uh, There was a conscious effort to organize a band of black men to prevent the lynching of one of our own. You know what I mean? It was hands on. Listen, we ain't waiting for, somebody to decide what's right or what's wrong exactly. we're going to take it upon ourselves to make sure the outcome is right mm-hmm. and i don't know if we do that anymore as as a people particularly as black men in our communities but you know i just wanted to add that little nugget of history as far as you know an organized effort mm-hmm. how we used to do we, we we've stormed the capital before mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and them brothers had their second amendment rights because they all were licensed absolutely yeah. absolutely yes. To carry them, uh, carry, and, and America didn't know what to do with that. Like right. black men with, with guns, no, they're licensed to carry. It's their Second Amendment right. Mm-hmm. Why do we have an issue with that? And most people don't know that the Second Amendment was written with an exclusionary clause for for black people for a long time. I think it's like fifty or sixty years <laughs> when it was originally written. It excluded black men from carrying guns. Yeah. Unless they were working for a white master mm-hmm. or somewhere, and they had permission to carry that gun. Yeah. Yeah. I look at how and I understand that the Republican Party is is fractured to some degree right now. But I look at the umbrella that MAGA <clears throat> that MAGA is starting to create for all of these these different radical groups and we, we got a chance to see you know this this all star cast, if you will, at the, at the um, <laughs> at the Capitol that day. All of these different groups coming up underneath that umbrella. I look at how they're mobilizing. Mm-hmm. I look at how brazen they're getting. I look at some of the things that they're doing mm-hmm. that just seems that, that to be building in the event, in the realistic event, yes. mm-hmm. that this man gets back into office. Is the village ready? for a full frontal assault that might be coming our way mm-hmm. if this man is elected again. That's a serious question. Yeah. Because you talk about civil war in a very real sense. Mm-hmm. You see a, a big fraction of society right now, mm-hmm. they're gearing up for when they say make America great again, taking America back. <coughs> I think we saw that day, mm-hmm. they're thinking in a very literal sense. Very literal. Yes. And that's whether he wins or loses. Good point. Yeah. 
whether he wins or loses. We're, we're heading that way. Yeah, I'm preparing myself for that. Win or lose, America's going to be a mess for, is, for a minute. Is the village ready for it, Alan Mark? Is it? I, I don't. <laughs> I personally don't think the village is ready. You have individuals within the village who are ready, but like I said, the grassroots efforts of coming together and organizing as an organization, whatever whatever title it has, we we have failed in that in that area. We can see. The writings on the wall of, you know, the 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 impeding headbutting that's that's going to happen in the event, like 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 Dr. Baker said, whether this man is elected or not, you you see it, you see it coming, but yeah. are we ready? Yeah. And we, as the elders in the community, are we are we preparing our children? Yeah, because because I think I genuinely think, and I said this when we talked before, Mark. I I think that we're going to a place. Where the military may have to intervene in our politics in this country at some point. I mean, what's the, there was a movie that just came out, um, Civil War, I want to say it was called. Mm -hmm. I went to the theater to watch it, went by myself. Okay. And I think indirectly that's what they were talking about. They were drawing a scenario of is this where we're going mm -hmm. to where the, the you know, military, they're, they're storming the Capitol to take down this rogue president. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking this is all getting really really real at this point and are we ready for what's coming i think i mentioned before on a, on a on a podcast mark and we were we were talking about the um i mentioned the secret service somebody interviewed one of the, the members of the secret service and they said you know he talked about how comprehensive they were as, as, a, as an organization blah 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 who would you is there any organization that you would compare to the proficiency of the secret service and this dude said the foi mm -hmm. yes he said i don't know how much you know about the yeah. foi mm -hmm. Yes. The Fruit of Islam, yes. mm -hmm. Farrakhan's crew. Yeah. Indeed. He said they are very yes. comprehensive. He said, Let, let's just say that at our agency, we have respect for their work. Yes. Mm. <laughs> they're disciplined, they're well-trained, disciplined. and they're committed. Right. He said, so on, a, on, on an everyday level, you want to look at the Secret Service and what we're about and how we train and, and how committed we are to the cause, that feels like a safe comparison. I thought, now that is high praise. Mm -hmm. How many of us are that ready, though? Right. I feel right. like something's coming. Yeah. Right. And I just want to pick up on one word that you used, because I wouldn't use the word ready. The groups that are most committed. Right. Yeah. There you are, go. Are the ones who want to force. Because I might be ready, but I'm not, I don't know how committed I am. Well, there's a good. The sacrifices <laughs> and, and the things I have, I have to adjust in my life. I mean, we can't get folks to go out and vote. How, how committed yeah. are we? Yeah, see? Yeah, yeah that goes into yeah. what I was saying. Yeah. Yeah, and then there's a there's a hope that I have that and it might be misplaced, might not be. When people saw January sixth, I'm not so sure that they 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 was as proud as the rhetoric that led to that. And there was some that disengaged from that because they saw, okay, now you're ready to take down the whole thing over this. <laughs> you, you, this we were just being political mm -hmm. and you all taking this seriously mm -hmm. because you're breaking down the money structure. We're talking Federal Reserve, we're talking everything. Mm -hmm. A civil war would disrupt all of that. Mm -hmm. It Texas could talk about all the succession in the world that it wants. The reality of it is this country is not like Lincoln did. It's not going to allow Texas to mm -hmm. the, the, put it this way. Like Lincoln said, he could care less about slavery. Yeah. Whether it was for or against, but it this country is going, be, is going to be united. Mm -hmm. and hence your thing about the military. Mm -hmm. The commander in chief is going to call. This is where this stops. Yeah. And you all stay in your house and we'll go deal with this right here I, I i don't i think the machine is a problem but i don't think the quote unquote i'll use this term very loosely right now the other side that's willing to go there to start this i think they're naive into what levels that who they think is on their side yeah. will go to prevent them and to say okay you took it too far i mean because and maybe maybe i'm naive i i'm under the impression and, and give me your thoughts that the average American is probably shocked, surprised, disappointed, whatever words you want to use, of how complicit legislators are to some of these radical acts and actions and everything else, 
for political expediency. I, and I know politicians, over, you know, by and large, especially those in Washington, can't be trusted. But, man, I won't lie to you, man. I was shocked when I saw just how much a lot of these legislators would jump on board in order to latch on to power. Mm-hmm. Is it just me? No. But that's why I'm concerned. And let's say, let's say uh, Trump wins. Now, he is the commander-in-chief of that army. Do you have enough people would stand up morally and say what you're asking us to do is wrong good question and we're not going to do that good question i am not of the mind anymore that we have morally strong courageous men and women but in general to say no we're we're going we're not going to do that because you know the little history we have of, of the of the event the, the capital it took a couple of people to say this is not going to happen you know Absolutely. If those people do not say at, in the right moment, we're not going to do this, or I'm not going to make that phone call, most of those people were, were by and large people like you and me, just workers, staffers, whatever, a few politicians or, or elected officials. But you had a lot of people, for, I'll give you one example. How is it that you get a call saying the Capitol is storming, you the National Guard, and you don't send folks in? Uh, yeah, right, right, yeah, right. Because we're waiting for an order. And he stood around for 187 minutes not giving that order. Wait a minute. You have a moral obligation, a legal obligation, a military. You stood up and said against all enemies, foreign and, and domestic, domestic, right? You should have been there, but you were waiting. Well, and we'll, you were waiting, and you were waiting. And we'll, that's my concern. When we'll, they threw the kitchen sink at the Black Lives Matter protesters yeah, yeah. in Washington. We'll yeah. say this. One the hope that we had, Mike Pence didn't give in. Exactly. Because technically, I mean, theoretically, I'm just dealing with theory. A lot of people don't like to deal with this, but what those people believed was the Electoral College was getting ready to vote. Mm -hmm. And that their vote, which is technically, but constitutionally, the final say, is the safeguard. And they was trying to influence that vote. Well, if Mike Pence goes with that, because that's what that's what this thing was. Yes. So if Mike Pence was like, no, I'm going to carry out because the VP is the one actually in charge of, of yeah. this this process. Right. Mm -hmm. It's the only power really a VP really kind of has. Yeah, exactly. He's in there. That's why they was looking for him. Mm -hmm. They was looking for him when they got in there to say, hey, you're going to suspend this and we're going to say he's still president. Mm -hmm. The vote is invalid. Mm -hmm. And you're going we're, we're here not going to vote for Trump. So when we say this, like in, the, in this scenario of civil war, I would say this. If there was a civil war, in my opinion right now, it would be because he lost. It's not going to be while he's in power. I agree. It will be if he's fretting losing power, mm -hmm. i.e. lost his election. Now, if he lost an election, I don't believe, just say like recently, I believe a lot of people, they might believe in certain conspiracies. But the military didn't come in and say, hey, uh, that was an illegit thing. Because you had, if you listen to him, General Mike Kelly, which was a Republican, mm -hmm. he hired him. He said, the closer I got to this guy, the scarier I got. Yeah. Mm -hmm. These are military folk. Yeah. And they held the line. So I'm hoping, just yeah. my theory. I'm more worried about the bigger picture on a world scale about him if he wins. Yeah. And the Supreme Court, of course, versus the civil war aspect right off. Yeah. The civil war aspect I worry about, if he loses, mm -hmm. not if he wins, and I'm not saying vote for him to yeah. avoid that. That's right. not what I'm saying. Right. I want to tie this to a local issue that, that Mark and Dr. Baker in particular, you, you two work on quite a bit. Dr. Baker, I know you've been asked to speak with law enforcement. You've been asked to speak with uh, fire, mm -hmm. first responders. I remember a meeting that I had after January 6th, mm -hmm. and it was a lot of us on a Zoom, and it was with the, and we called it with the mayor and the then county executive, Kathy Dahlkemper. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the amount of ex military mm -hmm. and active law enforcement officers that were involved and are involved, and corrections officers mm -hmm. that are involved with these extremist groups, right. I said, post post January 6th are there 
measures in place to identify people amongst your ranks in law enforcement, first response, corrections mm -hmm. that are either sympathizers or active participants in some of these groups? And if so, what is the punishment if, it, if that is discovered? What are the action steps if that is discovered? No measure was in place at that time on a county or a city level. Mm -hmm. And, and Kathy Dahlkipper at least admitted, like, you know what, that should probably be inspected. I don't know, for Mayor Schimber, I don't, he was kind of like, no, I don't even think it crossed his mind. But on a local level, when you see that you got these demographics involved with these, what should, what should we be doing to ensure that people that are serving, protecting, guarding, mm -hmm. first responding, mm -hmm. don't have these views and aren't living by these views? Uh, great question. And so they're, they're, in my mind, there are two discussions that are going to happen, and one we will never know, and that is white people, white men specifically, talking to each other, because it's a culture, yeah, and how we support that culture. And so, you know, we have public conversations where we're all together and we say the political right stuff, and then you and I go away and have a beer, and we're going to have another discussion, and that might be a whole different discussion. Do you really believe that crap? Blah 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 blah. blah. And that, to me, is the more critical conversation. And it is, it is in those moments where you need to have some really strong people who will speak against the, the, the flow, ebb and flow of the moment. And I just see whether it's locally or globally, nationally and globally, there are less and less of those people. I'm going to go back just real quickly when you talked about uh, Vice President Pence. We, what we forget is moments, we're talking like 30 seconds, 60 seconds, there was an African-American brother who was leading them away because they were, they were right, on his, right on his trail. And they showed the time. Like, if, if they had turned that corner, they would have got to Penn. I remember that yeah. video. I remember that and, video. And, and so he doesn't get a whole lot of credit. He, he like, literally. It was, it was security at was the, security the White House. Guard. Exactly. He was basically saying, follow me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and he led them away. 30 seconds later, if they turn that corner, this, this story is completely different. Right. Yeah. You know, Lynch Mike Pension. Pence and kill my. I mean, how do you have a? How do you have a? A gallop? Yeah. Yeah. Like they were like, are you serious? And so whether we're talking at the national level or the local level, and some of this stuff. I mean, again, I don't. I don't know if this is part of our conversation, but you know, it's all a part yeah, of the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> we, we got some officials in posi in position right now. that are doing some stuff that we are all scratching our head. You know, how is that ARP money, which is designed to get to certain communities, being hijacked? And, and, and very few folks are saying, this is wrong, let's stop the exactly. machine. And let's stop the machine right now. Say it, yeah. say it. So, I, again, I'm just finding less and less of those people. And, and so I'm concerned about where we're going and, and how we're going to get there. So, yeah. And so we have this wonderful conversation here. But guess what? The folks who we're talking about, they're not going to listen to this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We had our own podcast. Right. <laughs> Well, I, I know that police community thing, our, our relationship with police, you know, Al, bringing it back to you, I know that's all, that's a continued conversation. Indeed. In barbershops, you know, across this country, let alone in Erie, yeah. you know, and, and my guess is you hear more than your fair share of some of these firsthand narratives as, well, you know, good and bad, right. you know, because I, I can name you the law enforcement officers that I have a great deal of reverence and respect for and the work that they do in community. So we acknowledge the fact that it is not you know, a, a one narrative that covers all, right. but good, bad, or indifferent, I'm sure you're hearing a lot of these narratives in your position. Indeed. And like, like one of the questions that are, that, that's, that's asked often is what's the end goal if our enemy is not so much police brutality as it is, you know, the politics that's coming towards us and the, and, and the injustice or the imbalance on that level as Dr. Baker said, we, he don't feel like we have any individuals who are willing to sacrifice, you know, those those leaders, those grassroots leaders, those Black Panther mentality leaders or those 1921 Tulsa, Oklahoma leaders who have that mindset that we're not going to stand for this. Where are those individuals? Mm -hmm. I mean, nothing against the, the relationship that we're building with the, with the local police. And that's I love that. I love that effort. And that's a fine. That's a fine effort. I like the cause. But at the end of the day, you know what I mean? What, what, about, what about the other aspect of what we're facing as a village, yeah. per se, or as a people? You know? Yeah. 
and and that is the tricky part because when you again knowing that you've been involved with a lot of these discussions I, we've all been involved with a lot of these discussions in some way shape or form it is that balance of you want my opinion mm -hmm. until you don't like my opinion exactly mm -hmm. you know and then when you don't like my opinion all of a sudden oh we've had five meetings i didn't hear about it <laughs> <Right>. yeah <laughs> because you you don't like my opinion mm -hmm. anymore you yeah. know yeah there's there's this, this this whole notion about agreement that uh, skews the conversation and it is are we in agreement if we're in relationship true relationship you allow me to tell the truth my truth whatever it is and so we might be in disagreement and the relationship doesn't stop in fact it is it is fostered it's stronger because of our disagreements that I get to understand more about who you are more about what you're thinking about but if in certain circles and again I want to go back to like the Erie Police Department and there are a lot of officers again in my I don't know, 15 years working for the Erie Police Department in private conversations. Like, I grew up in the hood and I know about poverty. I said, how come you can say that to me? <laughs> That's what you need to say. You're, you're telling me, I get it. Well, I know you get it. But when we have the training sessions where it's important for you to say, what Dr. Baker's talking about yeah. is right on the money. You didn't say it then. Right. That's when it was important to say it. Yeah. And so, what kind of internal fortitude, courage that it takes? Again, I don't live his life, I don't, or, or her life. I don't know, but I do know in the moment, like, like, uh, most recent. I think this just happened yesterday, two days ago. An African American who was licensed to carry, uh, you know, sorry, he, he knocked on the door, and, and he doesn't know what it is, so he pulls out his gun. I said, "Whose is it?" And he opens the door, and the sheriff sees him, right? <laughs> He empties his clip in it. Mm. And then he says, drop your weapon. <laughs> no, I'm not making this up. That's... It's on film. Yeah. yeah. But my experience is this. That that officer, that sheriff, there are a whole bunch of folks that knew his character before he got to that moment. And probably knew, just like you said, you know there are certain officers or certain fire. Like, I have reverence for you because I know your character. Right. We also know the other side. And you, who work with a person day in and day out I'll get, again let's sh shift gears for a moment barbers know who's a good barber and who ain't so if I ask you for a recommendation you may not say don't say him but I might want to get you to this one because I kind of know mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. but at some point I got to come to you and say your skills man are weak and that's why I don't refer people to you to build you up that's what I find there are, there are officers who the department knows. You're a loose cannon. But why are you still on the force? Because nobody's going to say A, B, and C about that. And because they're protected by the union, we're not going to do anything. But if you show up at a crisis, it could, it could flip the wrong way. And again, that's whether it's barbers, police officers, pastors, on this continuum, they're very good and very bad. There's a whole bunch in the middle. And we know who they are. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we do. Mm -hmm. And so, in, in some cases, the stuff we're talking about here, some of these some of these decisions that we don't think about in the moment truly become life and death. Mm -hmm. you know? And I believe yeah. you, what we're seeing is a cultural shift and Indeed. a reaction to cultural shifts on everybody's part as far as we all are saying things in our lifetime that is challenging some of our what we know our norms. Uh, over here, you you're watching the nation turn browner mm -hmm. and darker. We're watching sexualities blur, mm -hmm. and we all have to acknowledge the human reactions that we are doing. But we all have to understand something here. We have to check ourselves in some aspect. Yeah. Oh, and that's everybody because how we react to change like he, he mentioned the officer right there I guess just my observation or my thoughts about this there was a time where superheroes the one rule you couldn't kill nobody right Superman can never kill nobody right mm -hmm. Batman and the yeah. bad guys knew it yeah. hey you know you don't do that I know you ain't gonna kill me so I keep doing it and right. that was the written rule when mm -hmm. it was them mm -hmm. or someone that they can relate to. The criminal was somebody that they can relate to, right. I guess. Mm -hmm. Well, I call it the Dirty Harry era came and crime became urban and associated with 
us mm -hmm. yeah. and the compassion towards it. The 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 what what, what was it? Uh, your uh, crime is a disease, and I'm the cure. What was he curing? Yeah. Mm. Dirty Harry, make my day. Make my day. Who was he talking to? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Who was the poor brother playing the role that that yeah. was yeah. facing the, the big forty seven yeah. or yeah. forty five? Yeah. Nick Nixon being the candidate for <laughs> Law and Order. Yeah. There we go. Mm -hmm. The Law and Order came yeah. in <laughs> because look at look at what happened. Now I mean, like this is all <clears> on <throat> full cycle here for the crack. In the pre-heroin era, those were junkies. Mm -hmm. Now we done moved to the mm -hmm. same people. Hey, you got to have, what's this, ni niacin or whatever? It's a capacity. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, 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 you got to have this, Narcan. 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 You got to have this because they were some, they couldn't help it. Mm -hmm. They was over-prescribed. Mm -hmm. And so they, they, the reason they're hooked is because some doctor over-prescribed them for their back, and now they gotta have heroin for that. Mm -hmm. So we gotta give them the Suboxone or this, this, this whatever. We got Narcan. Narcan brings them back. When it was us, mm -hmm. if crack had to have a Narcan, the cops would have said, "Hey, <laughs> why are we spending money on Narcan for these right. junkies?" Well, Michael what Jackson being addicted to, to pain pills had a whole different reaction than Rush than, yeah. than than Rush Limbaugh being addicted to Oxycontin. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> Right yeah. to, to your point. I don't mean to interrupt you, but to your point, brother. There's right. a compassion there for this new one, right? Erie County. We need the, the state in overdoses. Their mm -hmm. kids is going, right. but there's this compassion to these people. There's this. Let's give them some treatment. Yeah. My God, when it come to us, it's not that way. Right. It, it, the word is humanization. Yeah. There we go. You look at the trial of Kyle Rittenhouse. They went above and beyond to humanize mm -hmm. this young man. The judge is calling him, son, you need a break, son. You, you need a, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm having an emotional break now. Mm -hmm. And it was, but, but they humanized this man, this young man. Right. After, and so there's the word. So you write, for us, there's been a pattern of dehumanization. Well, you know, that's our history. Yeah. A pattern of dehumanization. Yeah. And, you know, as long as you can see them as other, I'm preaching to the choir. Go ahead. Yeah. Oh, no, I, you, you, you did it very well. <laughs> but when we get these lines of civil wars and we start dividing and decide, what I, I guess what I was trying to say is deeper now than just racism. Racism is my fight. Mm -hmm. Because there's some that's saying some parties have went too far with this gender issue. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of people like me that look like me, mm -hmm. not like me, but look like me, that's siding with that and saying, look, you can't choose gender. You can't you 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 you, you can't go into this bathroom or that bathroom. Mm -hmm. And they're saying society went too far with this thing. They care about that. So you got that. Just like in the early eighties, there was a lot of church members that were black that was against the bush and they went over here with bush mm -hmm. and they did it the church did it or let's go with the million man march farrakhan was on this spiritual journey he was called bringing us all together it was our own church that islam got in the way we can't support that so you have you never know why these groups are aligned or who is on this side over here and i think with trump He's building all these factions here. And it's, although we worry about the racism yeah. faction, he's got the faction where society has no discipline no more on his side. They painted the Democratic Party as this liberal, anything goes party. Right. And in the Democrats' defense, they're saying they got a right to love who they want. They got a right. So, this is a trying time right now, man. Because, okay. <laughs> I mean, like, look, I do. I believe LeBron should be able to play in, in, in the, what, the WNBA because he identifies as a woman? Hell no. Exactly. <laughs> Hell exactly. no. Exactly. Hell no. No, man, right. no. And th this is why. This I, is it, where we're at it, today. It is. And this is a slippery slope. We can't slope. ignore this. This is a slippery slope. And this is what I, I, I go back to my, my line as a Republican leading up to the Trump years. Uh -huh. it, 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 I see so many sides of this argument. The idea of a society with that's just no holes barred on every subject does not appeal to me. Right. I'm sorry. It does not appeal to me. There is no male. There is no female. You know, there is no leader. That, you know, it doesn't. It, I, you, you go to households, heaven forbid, heaven forbid you want a traditional household. 
you know, with traditional mother roles, traditional father roles, people will excoriate you just for the very notion of wanting tradition. And I'm like, I get the whole idea of change, but damn, we can't just throw everything out the window. Where we go? Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) We are arguing in school. There's a court case right now. A teacher refuses to acknowledge a what she thinks is a female child. My my wife is telling me about this. Go as ahead. A female child. The female child wants to be acknowledged as a boy, mm-hmm. and the teacher will not do it. Now, who's wrong? Now, here's what I would say. <laughs> Once you give me the name, I ain't calling you a boy or girl anyway. <laughs> give me the name. If you want to be Billy, let's just leave it at that. If you want to be Brian, I'll leave it at that. I'm not going to get in the debate of you with what you are as far as male, female. Now, I guess that would be a problem if we say all the guys line up on this side. All the, and, and, and this is where we're at right now. So am I a bad person to say, look, Science says this, and I and I, I tend to believe this. If you have these male organs right here, I need you to line up over here. <laughs> if you have this, I need you to line up over here. Then I, I guess we could take the debate of not what you think you got. What do you have? And then that'll take by. If you got both, then we got a problem. This really That's is the head scratcher one. that I'm willing to spend some time with. But this, this other is, stuff. All but of this. This is where we at, at, it at is, as a country. It is. And it's for tricky. some people. This is overbearing, man. Oh, man. Well, hear me just real quickly. Go ahead. It's not, in one sense, it's a slippery slope. But for me, it's not. It's not a slippery slope. It's, let me hear what you got to say about whatever it is you believe. For me, that's when it's not slippery. I can't legislate how you're going to believe. That's where it becomes an issue. Yeah. Because I'm trying to legislate my way of thinking that won't allow you to think or feel or be anything. You, you have the right to feel and think and be whatever you want. But as soon as I legislate that, now it's against the law for you to do it. Now I can punish you. Mm. That's, yeah. that's where I struggle with it. And it's not just going to the law because even the Pope got to deal with this now. The Pope has said they can they can be part of the church. Yeah. You, can, you, you can have lesbian couples or, or what have you. Now, his faction is saying, so this is what I'm saying. There's these splits all over, man. I mean, like, I know a church that at one time preached you couldn't be a female and be a minister, the minister of the church. Mm -hmm. 20 years later, you got a female minister. Yeah. What do you do? What do you say? Oh, no, I got, I got is to, that progress? I, I got to bring Al back in on this because I know that you're, you're a brother who, who studies the tenets of Islam. Uh-huh. Islam seems to have still some very clear lines on these subjects. Am I, am I wrong? I mean, I'm not the expert. Yeah. Yeah. True, true indeed. Mm-hmm. Um, here, here's my thing. Here's my thing. Is I find it funny that we're discussing the quote unquote slippery slope and how sides on both sides are fighting for the pros and the cons of it you know what I mean and, it, and I, I say that because it's funny that in the country that we are living in the topic that we're talking about today is the racism it seems to have taken a back seat to the he she or them it absolutely has you know what I mean? It absolutely not just on the show. I I have said Mark is my wit Mark is my witness. I have said when it comes to racism in this country, and and I could be one of ten thousand to believe this, I think that we have missed the boat. Yes. I think it's a secondary absolutely. issue to umpteen other that being yeah. one of them. Absolutely. Yeah. So so what do we so what do we do as as a people when you have our elders who don't see the the strong whether they're male or female, the strong uh, images or strong figures who could help lead us uh, through the through the conditions that we're currently in and that we're gonna evidently uh, potentially face, like we said, whether Trump is in or out. You know what I mean? Where are our leaders at? You know what I mean? Yeah, I want to bring another uh, religious piece of that, whether it's Islam or Christianity. Well, yeah. yeah, is you got to be really, really careful, and I'm standing on a 
uh, foundation that this is my interpretation of this foundation mm -hmm. uh, whether we're talking about sexuality or abortion or race or anything there's one thing I am absolutely clear on and that is God is a God of choice Agree. He's a God of choice and there, in my mind there will never be anything more important than your eternal salvation and he allows you to choose that and so everything else is underneath that and so if he's if he's saying and I and I love this approach there's good and evil light and darkness and then he says here's my answer choose life but you get to choose and where for me and whether we're talking about Islam or Christianity it's how attractive do you make God and how you process those decisions as opposed to using religion that says well, you know, God, the, the scripture says, you know, there's one man and one woman, and therefore it's got to be this way. He did say that. There's a man and a woman. But he never absolved choice, ever. We get, we get down to the basic fundamentals. There was Adam, and then there was his wife, and then they were about to sin. He could have interrupted. Free will. He could have interrupted. He didn't. Mm -hmm. But what he offered was, here's an attractive alternative. And we miss the boat in trying to, I'm going to defend this position or that position. It's really, let me help you understand the context of this God who allows choice that might help you make your decision, line up with him or see it differently, whatever. But your choice is your choice. This and is I'm true. never going to get away from that. So these, this idea, and here's where I think we sell the boat, like whether it's race. We have discussions about race. And when, when um, uh, scripture is used to, to support racism, mm -hmm. right, and slavery, right, I said, seldom do you hear the conversation that while, and again, I, I, I read the, the writers of Paul who said, if there is a, if there's an evil master, obey him, right? Well, that kind of supports slavery, except that he says to the slave master, you have an obligation too. And there's a way that you have to treat this person that will balance this out. Now, again, I'm not saying to use that to support slavery. What I'm saying is that everybody has a direction about how to love one another and what to do, which mm -hmm. is morally correct. We, we, take, we take our position and say, I'm going to take this scripture, or I don't know what it's called in the Quran. Is it scripture too? Again, I think it's a different word, but it's basically a scripture. And I'm going I'm to bank everything on this. And so you're going to make decisions, for example. African Americans chose abortion. I'm gonna sell out everything else because I believe and I'm pro-life. So everything else doesn't matter because Trump is he supports this position. And so now other stuff doesn't matter. And that's right. What, that's what I'm saying. You know, with respect to you, it's like how did we get here? Because I'm gonna sell out everything because and and, and I don't believe he's for or against. I think it's politically oh absolutely expedient. absolutely it's whatever. I don't think he cares one way or another. I don't, think, I don't think he cares at all. But so I, how do you follow that? I want to point out something here that's kind of sticking out without sticking out. Here's four intelligent African-American males discussing religion. And I can almost say it's probably more here in a barbershop mm. discussing religion than it is on Sunday discussing religion. Mm. And what I'm saying is the time is to understand that the barbershop has become the remaining institution of males in our community because the church does have to internalize itself and look at its audience and see what it's become. I think it has lost males and there's a difference that Deacon used to come to the barbershop too and bring his kids to the barbershop and but those kids it's not necessarily going to church today, but they still going to the barbershop. And so I believe what I would hope to see is that we start acknowledging the barbershop as an institution and the young barbers that's coming up today understand their role while they have the mic, so to speak, or the opportunity Ooh, that's powerful. To, to be what Mr. Axon, Mr. Smart, mm -hmm. or in my case, my cousin Vernon, and, and Richard, my cousin Richard, was to me, where they would 
understand that and be a positive or try to be a positive in my life versus I want to do with the barbershop institution now. Yes. When I came into the barbershop as a child, they acknowledged that a child or a woman was in the room. And it changed. Yes. They didn't necessarily change the topic matter, but how they said the topic yes. matter changed. Yeah. Y'all need to be in on that. Whereas in today's is they gonna hear it anyway. Uh, right. And so when these kids get this view and they're being shaped yeah. on what a male is, they're looking at that barber and saying, Okay, this is acceptable. If you I could hear this and they don't cut it out for the mom, they don't change their language for, for mom or anything else. Right. Why should That's I? Deep. That is deep. Why right. should I? My cousin Vernon, Mr. Axon, I ain't never heard that man. As a grown man, yeah, I never heard that right. man swear anything like mm -hmm. that. Charles or Harold, right. they might whisper a couple things, but I never heard it. Right. Whereas, I noticed a, just an observation, and I'm not criticizing. I'm just making a statement of what observation. I hope if there is barbers listening to this, that you understand your role, and that people are watching you. You know, they, they're watching you. Whether you choose to be a leader or not, that's up to you. But they do watch you and gauge you as a man. Because a lot of them, you're the only man they see. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the households, statistically, we, you might be that male that they see. Absolutely. Brother Al, we'd like to commend you on your mentorship. He has, Brother Al has a program here at Heads of State where he hires them, hires young men to come in and clean the shop give them job skills, interviews them, he teaches them, he works with them, trying to build young men. And See, that's I'm a, mad at Al. Al you should have led with that, man. I'm mad now <laughs> as the host. <laughs> it's, it's Barber Life Lessons Mentoring Program. Unpack it. And what we do is we, 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 the, the student or the child is brought in by either a mom and or dad and they're interviewed just like an interview process we introduce them to the interview process some of their assignments requires them to sweep the floor take out the trash answer the phone or whatever else is necessary within the shop uh, some of the other things that we offer is we teach these young men how to write in cursive how to tie a tie what it means to volunteer your services in your community and we do church visitations so uh, some of the things that we're trying to instill into these young men is to gradually uh, redirect them for those that need it into a path of productivity, positivity and productivity, that they can be better men in their homes, in their schools, and in their communities. My man, mm -hmm. that, I almost feel like I want to end it there. That's the most powerful note. I was mad at you for not leading with that, Al. <laughs> But I want to flip that and make that the closing remarks then. <laughs> okay. So that we end it on power. That's powerful, brother. That's powerful, man. And listen, if, if parents want to get their kids involved with this program, how do they reach out? Uh, just come on down to Heads of State Barbershop. Ask for me, Al Smitherman. Uh, we'll, we'll fill out the necessary paperwork, contact information, and we'll go from there. Got it, got it. So, Mark Blunt, you wanted to do some barbershop talk today. Talk today, uh, As we leave, tell the listener why you felt like it was important for us to hone in on this discussion at shop. Well, one, I think it's more organic. It brings us down to outside of whatever we were doing, our tower or whatever, and it brings us down closer to the people. And I just like the vibe here. And this is where uh, me and you started busting it up. This is where me and Jesse Tate used to say who's better than Magic or Jordan. And I still say Magic or whatever. And this is where men settle things in a peaceful, joyful way. And sometimes I don't have as much hair as I used to have or whatever. I don't have the need as, as I used to have. But I do miss the camaraderie. And so I, I, I love that you brought up this concept and I was honored to be able to come back and step in this shop once again. All right, so listen, to that. Go ahead, if, if I could add just real real quick on, on the topic of what the barbershop means to black men in, the, in our communities is we also serve as a haven for, you know, some of the things that you might want to share with just someone personally, you know what I mean? Along the topics of mental health awareness, you know, we have to be that ear for brothers who may be dealing with things personally or, or socially. 
you know what I mean, and, and offer them that wisdom to, to help them through those times. And that's what we as barbers like to pride ourselves on. It's not just the haircut that you're getting. That's right. You're getting a service. You're getting a service and you're getting a safe space. Absolutely. A safe space that was created for us generations ago that continues to be a safe space. And Mark, I edify your comments, man, on, on the, the, the new barber, the new generation of barbers understanding their place in the village and just how much of a voice that they have. Sometimes, unless, you, unless you're taught to, to understand, you don't get the megaphone that you have. You're thinking, that's hey, just my opinion, it's just the way I get down. No, you got an audience. You yeah, might want to be conscious of that as you move, you know. But listen, I appreciate having an opportunity to be a heads of state today, being able to, to talk amongst ourselves, you know, in your place of business. Thank you so much for hosting us today. Absolutely. Al, and that's it for our show today. I want to thank my guests, obviously my co-host Mark Blunt, who is always there for me, him and Chuck Camerata. I want to thank the good doctor, Dr. Paris Baker, for bringing his wisdom to the mic every time, every time I get a chance to sit down with him. It's always a pleasure. And my man, Al Smitherman, barber extraordinaire for his time today here at the shop. I'm Marcus Atkinson. Um, that's it for, for our discussion today. Tune in next time as we discuss and analyze local and national issues. I want you to remember that next 2.0 streams on Fridays on all major podcast platforms. And the fourth Sunday of the month at 4 p.m. on WQLM PBS NPR, which is 91.3 FM. And remember, there's another feature. If you want to leave a message, comment, or suggestion for the show, you can call the next hotline at 814-240-8816, 814-240-8816. There you can give your opinions, your thoughts, your suggestions. We're looking forward to hearing from you. Uh, lend your voice to the show. You might even hear your comment or your voice on the air. I'm Marcus Atkinson. Come and join us again so you can hear about what's next for our communities and our democracy. Peace.